So our session today is about uh, technology and marketing during the 20s and 30s when the electric guitar came about and we have uh, three, the three people in the world who are really qualified to talk about this, I think. <laughs> so I'm going to throw the microphone up and you'll grab it like a baseball bat and no, uh, please take it away. <laughs> okay, this was sprung on me. I knew nothing about this. Um, I hate microphones. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> wow, technology. Well, I, I think with my pickup uh, slideshow yesterday, most of you understand how I feel about the technology and the development of the technology. Um, I think the only important aspect of talking about that is just realizing that the technologies were invented for other reasons. Tele telegraph, telephone, microphone, uh, Victrola, and, and as it went along in steps, you know, there was the amplification, um, and there were, there were driving reasons for all of those things to take place, and it was communication. The telegraph, the telephone, without needing to talk to each other, nobody would have cared. We, you know, we'd still be yelling across the room. Um, and then radio, and then the ability to be able to talk to loud, large groups of people. I remember reading one blurb about uh, Magnavox, the horn speakers, and the original, original, micro, original microphones and amplifiers for those. I believe it was the late teens, early 20s um, in Los Angeles. They put a bunch of them on balloons, uh, uh, hot air balloons, and lifted them into the skies, and uh, I think it was McKinley, President McKinley, who addressed the who addressed the crowd with these amplifiers above on on balloons tethered to the ground, and they actually used radio transmitter to transmit the signal to the amplifiers on the balloons, so the whole crowd could hear it. That was quite early, and it was I'm sure it was uh, something that was put together by Magnavox to to show everybody how cool their stuff was, because they had the first real portable um, amplification that you could take out in the field and do dances, uh, you can put in churches, hall, whatever. And it, it actually doesn't, didn't sound horrible, and it was one of the first true electromagnetic driving units that pushed a disc that, of course, was amplified by virtue of a megaphone, basically, that big horn that expanded. Um, then, then, they, then, of course, they, they, they made tubes better, they made amplification of circuits better, and then they went to the uh, crude cone speaker that didn't sound so thin and tinny. And I think one of the problems with early Victrolas, early horn units with mica and metal discs and stuff like that, was it sounded not at all natural. It was, it was terrible. I collect those for part of my museum exhibit because I like to hear, show people what they sound like, and they just, they're just they're just nasty sound. In fact, I jump in just about the thing. The word phony actually comes from the fact that early telephones sounded, and you know, this technology sounded so bad. Really? Yes. And so the word phony actually comes from it sounds like a unnatural, like a telephone. Mm -hmm. I knew I learned something. Um, and, and so you know, there, there was there was this this move towards more more organic sound, so we could what come out of those speakers sounded more like what we're doing now. And then the paper speaker was invented. First ones I, I've seen were inverted, so there were cones that went with a point outward. And then they started becoming more flat. And they started becoming inverted, and they started um, using better. Um, drivers, and you got to remember all this time, amplification. Now, the, I don't know how many of you know what an amplifier really does. All, all the ampl all the amplifier does is makes more electricity. That's all it does. It puts more power into an electromagnet to drive something harder. Okay, that, that's all. That's all it does. And so, the the better the the bigger, better and bigger the, the speakers got, the more the more power you needed to be able to drive the electromagnet behind the speaker to be able to push that cone in and out, to be able to drive those sound waves. So as, as, the, as the cones got better, the speakers got, the speakers got better, the amplifiers became better, and then there was the problem of portability. This is all coming up to the Rickenbacker electric guitar, basically. 
And so, because they all worked on batteries, and a lot of them worked on wood cell, which were basically jars um, in, in wooden enclosures, like eight jars with electrodes in them and acid that you had to carry around. They were dangerous, they were fragile, they were heavy. And the early amplification like that was unbelievably expensive, like the very first computers, unbelievably expensive. Um, there was a really early amplifier uh, that lasted that long by Western Electric in 1921-22. And this, I, I find it intriguing because it was designed by Western Electric to be able to put into your house. And it was uh, two or three hundred dollars. It was, it was a beautiful wood cabinet. It had a, uh, a, a, a 6A amp, I think, Western Electric amp, and it went through tubes. And it had a diaphragm. Uh, an electromagnetic diaphragm, diaphragm speaker driver and a folded horn inside. The whole thing's about this big. And the reason I mention this is because their idea, because this was when a lot of telephones started coming into homes, right? And they wanted to be able to produce programs that you subscribe to that they put over the telephone line into these amplifiers. Mm. First internet. Mm. Basically. But the thing is, is there was this guy in New York decided he got this crazy idea. Well, I'm just going to build a big antenna and broadcast this stuff. And anybody with a receiver, because there were a lot of guys building crystal receivers and stuff back, they could pick this stuff up and get it for free. And that, so that was what they think lasted. No time. But that's actually the first kind of high class portable amplifier. And it did work on batteries, but it worked on a really small battery. So it was fairly easily portable. I, I was just saying that when I was doing my research on the, my presentation and looking up FC Hall, I didn't realize that FC Hall actually started out with a battery recharge. Yes, that's, no, that's exactly what he did. And oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he um, he had uh, when he was uh, in his early teens, and he had like a little wagon. And what he did is he would go around and like milk delivery. He would pick up the empties and bring you the full ones. And uh, he was doing like they say those Edison. Uh, you know, A, B, and C cells. Really? Yeah. And uh, and so uh, yeah, and, that, and that's and that's and that was the uh, the beginning of uh, radio, radio and tele, tele yeah. uh, television. Oh, the, radio, the company. Yeah, cool. radio tell. And, and I might say that another important thing uh, that drove forward the technology um, uh, was World War One, and specifically military applications for radio. Uh, we're really lucky, University of South Dakota, we just happened to have an old military radio manual from the 19, late 19-teens. And it's really fascinating. It's basically a guide for how to operate the equipment. And, you know, considering that the, the Audion tubes, uh, lead to force tubes, are really just developing, uh, the first patent was in 1906, and, uh, you know, really just developing in the, the early teens. Um, you know, already by, you know, for the, for the war effort, that, that was really, that, that technology was accelerated. And then by the early 20s, you had the first commercial radio stations. You already have quite a few. A lot are founded in 1922, for example. And you get these uh, very expensive units that you could buy. Um, some of them are beautiful. A lot are just really simple. I mean, they're just black boxes. The tubes stick out the top. And then they'll have a, one of those Magnavox horn speakers. And uh, one of those speakers is exactly what Deerdorf showed with his violin in 1922. So that was all coming about at the same time. Another technology that was important uh, was the development of uh, electronic recording prior to uh, the, like, 1920, I think it was 1924, 25. Um, recording was done through horns to a, a manual cutter. Um, in the mid-20s, they developed ele electronic microphones. And so they, that, that was another really important technology. The fidelity of recording went up dramatically um, from acoustic to, to electric recordings. Um, and so you have these uh, these better pickup designs. They're, they're more, they have more fidelity. They're, they're, um, intended to reproduce music, not just reproduce a, a 
spoken voice over the telephone. Um, so all those technologies are also critical. Um, the, the, there were paper cones, but they were for, um, uh, in, the, in the 19 teens, but they were for patents for uh, uh, basically phonographs. But then you get the actual paper cone speaker in the mid-20s that develops very rapidly. And you'll also see with, um, with uh, the, the radios of the 20s would often, you'd have the, the uh, receiver amplifier unit and then you'd have a separate speaker cabinet. And you'll see the speakers changing over time and, and going from these like massive primitive looking field coil units and getting smaller and smaller and uh, more efficient. So there was really quite a bit of, of stuff that was available and familiar to people but as it improved, it became more practical to, to use for um, uh, more demanding applications like actually reproducing music. I mean, you, know, you touched upon something that is, I think is really, really important when you talk about the rise of electronic recording. Um, that changeover had huge implications for, I mean, you know, we've been concentrating on the electric you know, guitar, of course, this weekend. But you know, it's important to remember, as like Lynn was saying, none of this was happening in a vacuum. People were adapting and adopting and experimenting, and um, both um, uh, with you know, the electronics and the technology, but also culturally. And one of the things that happened with the rise of electronic recording is the nature of what could be recorded started to change. <coughs> Before, you were trying to uh, re basically capture a live performance. And it was important for it to be loud, because otherwise it just wouldn't make it into the cone. But with the rise of electronic where you're using these microphones, these sensitive microphones, you could not only capture higher fidelity, you could also record combinations of instruments that were not uh, typically used, because you could mix. And one of the first and most important things that happened from this was singing styles change. You have the rise of the crooner, the person who sings softly into a microphone. Before, when you are uh, before uh, recording uh, an amplification, uh, you had you know typically well, opera singers, bel canto, people who could sing naturally very loud to be heard in a room. You know, a room. Suddenly, you have the Bing Crosby's. People who um, were you know, whispering and who couldn't be heard in a in a band situation without without this. You also see uh, that I remember finding an article from the 20s about how radio and um, and and recording were bringing back these um, obscure instruments because not only was there the ability to record these instruments, things like, I keep going back to clavichords, don't ask me why, but this is the clavichord. They put clavichords and harpsichords and unusual you know, instruments that weren't known back in these, in these days. And um, they could, one, they had the technology to record them, and two, they, um, the programmers for radio stations were looking for novelty, for things that people hadn't heard. And so, again, all of these things are happening. Yes? Well, I was just going to interject. It was also the first time where you could actually do some electronic gimmickry. And, uh, you know, Albino Ray is a perfect case in point where I'm not sure what year that he first did Stringy the Puppet, uh, but it was this amazing thing that was only possible, like you said, with this new recording technology where he would play the steel guitar and that was sent through a signal through a couple of little speaker drivers that a woman held against her throat and then they would mic her voice and this weird ethereal steel guitar singing voice would come out and it was so weird that when they shot a soundy film of it they had like invented this little puppet named Stringy who was supposed to be doing the singing but it's like you know that that couldn't have existed it, 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 and five years ten years earlier right and also too the other thing that you want to emphasize, you know, we've been talking about telephone technology and radio technology, movie technology, uh, you know, and the sound was a big thing. And again, it's no surprise that so much development of the electric guitar happened in Los Angeles because, you know, the movie industry was there, which was the highest tech 
uh, you know, artistic endeavor of its day. And so they had, um, uh, you know, you, could, you had people who were developing high quality amplifiers and speaker systems for movie theaters. And so it's a natural, you know, it's a natural thing that they would have, you know, used this. And, um, so let me jump in. <laughs> well, so what ends up happening is around 1929, 1930, amplification becomes more accessible. Um, there's radios in almost every house, and, and now a lot of houses actually have electricity. Oh, I, I should also mention in the 1930 census, one of the pieces of information they took when they went around is, does this person have a radio set? That's actually a checkbox. In 1930? In the 1930 census, yes. Wow. And what was the percentage, you know? I, I don't know. I, I've just noticed it when I've done census wow. research. Now, that's particularly interesting yeah. because um, I know uh, that I remember reading an uh, article in the music trades that talked about um, expanding the market uh, for radios uh, by making sure you still had battery operated radios for sale because they were making the point while electrification is becoming very common, it's still not all over the United States. It's, you know, it's by, by, the, by the late 20s, it's very common on the coasts but in some places, especially the South, you know, where I mean, there were places in the South uh, that didn't get electrified until after World War II. You know, one of the reasons why the Tennessee Valley Authority was doing was the, uh, doing the things to. It, well, in this part of the country, Wichita, you know, metropolitan areas or cities, smaller cities might have electricity, but the farms wouldn't have it. My mom says she remembers they would listen to the radio and it was battery powered. And it was controlled by our father because he had programs he wanted to hear. And if the battery, if they ran the battery down, they were in trouble. Yeah. So they didn't just listen to anything. There was a federal initiative called the Rural Electrification yes. Project that uh, was a, 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 a big focus all through the, the Midwest. And, and the, the rural population years. was quite a lot more sizable then and now too. Kind of like getting internet out there. Yeah, yeah. Same, same concept, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I keep the hijacking thing with the um, Hijack away. Yeah. I, another hoard of stuff that I bought was a bunch of really old electronic manuals. And it's interesting because there was an RCA manual from the mid-1930s on television. And it was basically like, television is coming, you better get ready. Yeah. Like, this is coming, you, but you got to learn this. Yeah. And uh, in, in the context, I think it's important to remember that everything was changing so much that even though most people didn't have TVs in their house until the early 50s, they knew it was coming by the mid 30s. By the late 20s. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Well, right. I mean, um, the uh, the Germans had public uh, television broadcasting by the mid 30s, and uh, and of course, um, you know, in the UK, uh, I think the BBC actually started television broadcasting for a short while in the early 30s but didn't consider it economically viable. When, when the screen was actually about that. Yeah, well, yes. yes. Yeah. And, 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 if, and if you look at old pictures of old music stores back back in the day, the 20s and 30s, there, there, were, there was guitars, but there were radios and, and, and horns. There were speakers. A music store meant music. Yes. It meant instruments as well as radios and stuff. So you, look, you think about that, you think about the technology, they blend right there in the same room. The uh, electronic technology with the music technology. They're in the they're in the same section of the Sears and Montgomery Ward's yes. catalogs too. Yeah. That all that stuff is just uh, just mixed together. Yep. And um, another thing I might say about uh, well, going back to the census. Now, why would the government be interested in knowing who had radio sets? Well, there's a couple of things. It's just like they're tracking now who has access to the internet. What is the economic development of the country? <coughs> But also, you're looking at a time of political instability. Um, how can they communicate rapidly with the entire population in the event of a political crisis or something you know, of that nature? Right. So, so knowing how, how many people can we actually reach if something critical is happening? Well, a radio set is, was the most immediate way to communicate with mass numbers of people. Um, going back to, uh, so I mean, it's, it's really well established that, that 
radios were increasingly commonplace. They were, they were unusual and expensive in the early 20s. By the late 20s, you really see a lot of, a lot of stuff on the market, a lot of advertising. Um, when that relates to instruments, you don't really have much. Um, one of our major resources for researching the early history of, of electric instruments are actually popular science magazine and the various um, science magazines. They're fascinating. They're, they're um, devoted a lot to home projects, like how to build this, how to build that, or they'll report on so-and-so built this crazy device and it does this or that. And um, so in this period of the late 20s to 1935, you'll still see these articles where they talk about, you know, so-and-so built this electrically amplified guitar, so-and-so built this electrically amplified violin, isn't that cool, isn't that novel? By 1935, that just disappears. It's like there's a it's wall gone. between 1934 and 35. You no longer see these articles. And so I think that's a critical point where the media realizes they don't have a story anymore about somebody who homebrewed an electric violin. 1935, all of a sudden, this is old hat. You're not, you're not seeing that anymore yeah. in, the, in the science magazine. And, and that's, I always thought that was really curious. It's like when, when it, that's, that's about the same time, the Epiphone, Regal, Gibson, pretty much every, every major company had said, okay, we give up. Car was wired straight into the radio system with none of none of this stuff in the middle. That was a very typical style of reporting for this type of thing. It was really based on the novelty factor. Oh, it did this weird thing. It's it's really neat, and you'll see that in some of the early patents, where, where multiple patents will cover this idea that we're wiring the unit directly into the system, and the guy's playing over here, but in fact, you hear it somewhere completely different whether it's in a different room on the other side of the room or through the radio, you know, in someone's home miles away. And you know, it's funny when you say that because, um, and I'm going to jump uh, ahead a few decades for a second, this is one of the most unusual thing about the electric guitar and the electric bass compared to other instruments. For the very first time, you have uh, a musician who is completely separated from the sound source, also, who is mobile. You've had that before, for example, like with church organs, because they're not necessarily right next to where you know the pipes are. But the idea that a musician can be playing and moving on stage, and yet nowhere near you know the amplifier. If you're doing that with almost any acoustic instrument, uh, you're going to get variations of what people hear. And so, that actually kind of ushers in a new style of performance. That, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's a, you know, by freeing people from having to stay in one place on stage, you're moving seats from a stage, essentially. You don't actually have to go to the 50s. 1936, Mont Ward Catalog, wireless guitar unit. Wow. Put your guitar into a radio transmitter and be heard throughout your home. <laughs> That sounds like a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was in one issue, one time. Yeah, one issue. And, 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 and all the kids said, Mom, and all the parents said, No. <laughs> and, and that was it. <laughs> and, uh, wireless guitar in 36. Well, you the know, gentleman in the cap. <laughs> well, on the same subject, you know, what year did the EH-185 amp come out? Was it 38 or something? 30, like that? 30, yeah, 30. You know, 38, they, they were making a, a, a thing that you could take the amplifier out and put it next to you and put the speaker cabinet, you know, where you desired it to. And, I mean, well, no, as soon as, as soon as that amp actually came out, the 150, they had an external speaker cabinet. The, that, they had that extra jack in the back. Mm -hmm. You could plug it in, you could put an amp over here with a speaker and an amp over here with a speaker. Yeah, or, or a speaker, totally different way of thinking than just yeah. a few years before. And it was, it was for the purpose of echo because they understood the delay in the cable from the amplifier over here with the speaker to the time it would take for the signal to get to the other speaker would give you a little bit of delay and so you would sound bigger. But but of course the earlier things, the amplifier was a separate unit from the speaker anyway. You buy those units separately. So I guess that wasn't really No, this was an amplifier with the speaker plus a speaker. Oh 
Plus but Deke, Deke is actually building. talking about Deke is actually talking about a head in a cabinet that you could lift out over, and then you had oh, two. Okay. You had an amplifier and you had a speaker. And National Dobro did that as well. Yeah. But again, the people who were often using these at that time were either you know a, a one playing Hawaiian style, mm -hmm. which tends to be stationary. Or the, the even playing, uh, you know, the guitar, with some exceptions, they often were sitting. And again, later on, you get this trans. Um, in fact, your guitar illustrates this perfectly with the, uh, you know, the uh, the Bigsby, where making a guitar with the switch on the lower bout would have been unthinkable uh, just a few years before because it would get in the way of the player completely. And yet, this is, I mean, here's a sign that, you know, this guitar was not designed to do that, and that wasn't considered a bad thing at all. It's like, no, this is designed to be played standing up, and that, again, implies a more... Um, a better show. Yes, I mean, more active style of performing, and which goes along with a lot of things that Deke said about these people were... These were showmen. This was all about a show. People hear with their eyes. And so that's why you want Cadillacs covered, oh no, it was a Pontiac, covered in silver dollars and pistol grips. You want guitar shaped pools. You want nudie suits. And, you know, this is about being larger than life. This is a, basically, this is grand opera translated to the Grand Ole Opry. Well, and, and not just the countryside, you, you start seeing pictures of blues guys in the late 40s out in the audience with their archtop electric guitars doing splits and stuff like that. You know, guys like T-Bone Walker and Walker, Dave, Dave yeah. Brown, you know. I think, I think they were the first guys to actually really start moving around on stage and using the guitar as a prop and playing it behind your head and all that it, kind of stuff. It, exactly. And Fred, Frederick Deardorff's early 20s pattern specifically mentions a vaudeville application where you could be appear to be playing the violin over here and the sound is coming out over there and that's a novelty offered, you know, it's like, oh, you can use this for these vaudeville acts. So, um, you know, they were fully aware of this, uh, this performing aspect. I believe that's our cue. Oh. After all, because uh, people have gotten used to getting music and voices right out of the sure. air with the radios, yeah. out of thin air. Ventriloquism. Yeah. Uh, in the 30s, radio you know, spread across the country and, and had a lot of market penetration. The local radio stations had, had to find something to fill the air. Absolutely. And they hired lots of groups to come in to have a 15 minute or half hour thing. Seems to me that must have created a tremendous market for musical instruments, guitars, violins. No, whatever. This, exactly. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about I, you know, I've seen these reports about the use of um, obscure and unusual instruments, um, specifically for this because of novelty. I keep going back to this novelty thing, but you know, especially the twenties and the thirties, they were the age of novelty. Uh, this was the age where people were interested in pole sitters. This was the age of where um, any kind of new entertainment, it's, well, it's the first era in America where truly mass market entertainment that is easily affordable by the people becomes available. Movies are only a part of that. It was uh, everybody... Houdini. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You know, and so, in other words, this is... Uh, I mean, the electric guitar is so much of its age, and uh, it, it, it's and you really, in some ways, can't um, separate it from that. And in this one case, I would say is, and electricity at that time, even though it was very old, was a novelty, and they were applying it to everything, whether it made sense or not. Let's electrify it. Let's see what happens. Yeah, well, that, those John. comments just made me think um, of like the early photographs of uh, these kind of small jazz ensembles. I'm sorry. Can you... Those comments just reminded me of you know some of the early photographs of like um, jazz ensembles, like you know people like Ma Rainey's group or um, the old Dixie.
Dixieland jazz band type images. It's a very motion-filled photograph. You know, you just have all the horn players kind of in these zany poses mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of... Uh, well, no, uh, exactly. And what they're trying to do is, uh, still image, evoke a sense of what you would be seeing right. at their gigs. And, you know, especially used with that, you see today, um, I mean, I used to be in marching bands years ago. And um, in Los Angeles, there were definitely a difference between the marching bands at the white high schools and the African American high schools. And let me tell you, the African American high schools were much cooler. Uh, we would just sit there and march and do our thing. They would put on a show. We're talking trumpets into the air, routines that were incredibly complicated. It was about, again, hearing with your eyes. And so this is, again, I think you see over and over. And it starts, I say, around this period. You're trying to give us a hint for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>